Some of this content may disturb sensitive listeners. Tales of the Night Sky Journey through the celestial sphere to discover the Greek and Roman myths about the stars and constellations. Immersive audio drama for starry nights. Welcome back. This is Season 3. I feel sick from the tears, from all the crying. My eyes and neck hurt from staring out to sea for too long. I can never go back to Crete. I've betrayed my home, my family, the land itself. And I've been betrayed in turn. Abandoned on this empty island. But I tell myself, Ariadne, it doesn't matter. Look out to sea and remember the stories. The stories will comfort you. Though I'm not sure that they do, because so many of these stories are marked by pain. So many of them, including mine, contain a betrayal. And a bull. This first bull was Zeus himself in disguise, and the princess he abducted and raped was my grandmother, Europa. She came from Phoenicia, land of the master seafarers, sailors who truly knew how to navigate by the stars. She was born into a royal household, daughter of King Agenor and Queen Telephassa. Their kingdom of Tyre was surrounded by the dazzling sea. And though the ports were always busy and brusque, Europa's own life was sweet and unhurried. But trouble was on the way. And she knew it because of a dream. She was in a deep and honeyed sleep on the cusp of dawn when the dream came, sent by Aphrodite. Europa. Europa, come with me. Europa. Europa, come with me. She doesn't know who the voices belong to. She can just feel both her arms being pulled. When she opens her eyes, she sees them, two women fighting over her. One woman is familiar, Phoenician, Europa knows this by her clothes, the long embroidered tunic, the bright shawl covering her hair. The Phoenician woman pulls Europa close. She smells comforting, sweet, slightly sweaty, with a hint of milk. I nursed you, she tells the girl. You're mine. Europa is suddenly yanked out of the safety of those arms by the other woman, who holds her just as tightly. This woman's smell is alien to Europa, unknown herbs and flowers. Her clothes are strange too, a multi-layered skirt shaped like a bell, a tight blouse open at the neck. It will be all right, whispers this foreign woman. It will all be fine. It's simply Athena's will that you come with me. Two women from two different lands, thinks Europa in the dream, and they both want me as their child. What am I going to do? My grandmother opened her eyes and found that this time she was back in her little bed under the royal roof, shivering with fright. She called to her maids who washed her gently, rolled up her dark hair and knotted it, dressed her in royal purple, marked her eyes with coal and calmed the frightened girl. 
She ran downstairs, drank some water, chewed on a fig, and then picked up her golden basket and rushed out into the sunshine. She was too young to worry about a dream after all. I knew Europa when she was old, when her hands were gnarly and her dark skin had dried up like a hardened fruit. She would tell me the stories of her youth and I would stare at her hands and try to imagine them smooth and young and picking flowers. Because she loved to pick flowers. She forgot about the dream as she roamed the high grassed meadows by the sea with her companions, giggling and singing, the sound of the waves buoying their spirits. Do young girls lose their heads when they pick flowers? Do the dark gods know to seize them when they're giddy and distracted like this? Europa should have remembered Persephone's fate, how the Lord Hades snatched her into the earth when she reached for a flower. Europa should have told her mother about her dream. She should have stayed home with the shutters closed tight. But when the gods desire you, they always find a way in. Zeus poured himself into Danae's room as gold. My grandmother had no chance. Out under the sun's glare, Europa walked with her friends. Her golden basket was already full of narcissi, hyacinths, violets and sweet red roses. When the bull appeared. All the girls gasped. This was no ordinary beast. The bull was large and gleamed yellow, with a perfect circle of white drawn on its forehead. Its two horns glowed like crescent moons. Its eyes were large and grey. It smelt of crocuses and saffron. The girl stroked and kissed it, and when Europa hugged it, the bull licked her neck delicately. (laughs) Didn't she suspect something was off? As a child, listening, it was always at this moment in Europa's tale that I found myself wanting to scream... I had to be very, very careful, because my grandmother didn't like any show of violent emotions. If I shouted or swore, that would be the end of her storytelling, and I would be sent to my room. So I learnt to breathe deep into my belly and clench my fists, all the while wanting to reach back into the past, back into that sunny meadow, all the while wanting to grab hold of the young Europa's shoulders and shake her and shout... Remember your dream, Europa. That dream was a warning. And as I would tremble with the force of my contained emotions, my grandmother would fix me with her dark eyelashed eyes and say, Understand this, Ariadne. That dream prepared me for what was absolutely destined to occur. And I would squirm with frustration. Nothing is predetermined. We make our own choices. I believed that as a child and I still believe it today. It was my choice to love a stranger. A terrible choice, a terrible mistake, but it was mine to make. But as a child, Europa wasn't like me. She was docile and guileless. And I suppose that was what used to infuriate me most. At this point, if I'd managed to stay calm, my grandmother would stroke my head as if I were her favourite yellow dog and then return us to the meadow and to her story. The bull, she would say, seemed to have singled me out for particular attention. When she sat under a cedar tree, it approached her and gently nuzzled her arms. She made flower chains and laughingly draped them over the bull's horns. And when the beast knelt down and offered the girl its back, Europa willingly climbed on. She held on to those dazzling horns as the creature walked in the sun, away from the other girls. The bright blue sea glinted in front of them. The bull suddenly quickened its pace and began to race towards the waves. Europa clung tight onto the horns as the animal plunged into the sea. And then they were in the water. And she wasn't panicking... Her ancestors were seafarers. Her mother was part nymph. The water was buoyant and blue. Europa, sitting on the bull's back, turned her face towards the land. 
stretched one hand towards her friends, and her tunic caught in the wind like a flag. Before the kingdom of Tyre, and all its bustle and merchants and friends and family and servants disappeared. Out in the empty sea, Europa reminded herself that she knew how to swim. She would be all right. And so the bull glided through the water with the girl on its back. The sea was dark, no land in sight, when dolphins surrounded them, leaping joyously out of the water. The Nereas rose up through the waves and greeted them, astounding Europa with their beauty. There were so many of them. Some sat on dolphins, some seemed to simply float on the sea. Their skin was like water, they wore jewels in their hair, though their queen had crab claws in hers. When Poseidon himself rose from the depths, Europa felt her heart beat unsteadily. The Earthshaker, the blue god of the sea, laughed when he saw her. His tritons put their long tapered shells to their lips, and the air resounded with their music. Europa felt herself fill with joy and wondered what this celebration might mean. The deities slowly sank back into the water. The sea grew still, and the bull kept on swimming. From then on, their journey was interminable. The bull swam a straight, unwavering line, and not a soul crossed their paths, not even a distant ship. It was as if Europa and the bull were now the only living creatures in the whole watery domain. She was exhausted, and sleep tugged persistently at the waterlogged hem of her dress. And I wonder, did my grandmother ever consider death as she was pulled through the ocean? Did she think about just letting go, and allowing the water to seep into her mouth and ears? and gradually submerge her? Or was she immune to the melancholy that seizes the rest of us in the family? Though she never told me what she felt as the bull swam those many miles, I knew she was a happy girl who believed that life would win through. I also know that if it had been me on the bull's back, I would have happily slipped off, opened my mouth wide, swallowed as much water as I could and let myself sink into the depths. Eventually, the bull and the girl reached land. The animal heaved itself out of the sea, and Europa toppled from its back and onto the sand. They'd arrived in Crete, though Europa didn't know it yet. Exhausted and wet, she slept. And when she woke, there was no bull only Zeus standing there naked above her. And I can't bear to think about what happened to her. My poor kidnapped grandmother, uprooted from her home and family. She would stand on the shore those first days looking out to sea, remembering the city of Tyre its dark cedar trees guarding the land, its harbours thick with ship masts and the sailors' shouts. She still felt those ties to home and family sustaining her. She still believed she might one day be returned to her life. I find now that I'm not at all comforted by thoughts of my grandmother. I've lost track of the days... I don't know how long it's been since Theseus dumped me here. My heart aches. The pain is sharp and very real. My thoughts loop and loop. I try to understand. How was I promised so much love and then left on an island to die? My despair is accompanied by my homesickness. I sit by the temple here looking out to sea and find that I miss Crete so much that the ache for my motherland is starting to replace the ache of lost love. I miss the rugged land and its harsh mountains, the lines of gnarly olive trees, the deep windy valleys, the taste of honey rich with thyme, the scent of night-blooming jasmine in the darkness of the night. 
I miss my sister and my friends, the temple and the dances on the labyrinth, the palace spilling itself into the night. I even miss the sound of my brother roaring in its depths. If I think about these things too much, I feel myself evaporate, as if my body can't contain the strength of these emotions. It's a terrible thing to be exiled from Crete. My grandmother looks at me from across the years and says, I thought you were strong, Ariadne. Why do you dissolve so easily? I've brought our country to ruin, country to I reply ruin. aloud. I, reply I can aloud. never go back I can after, never what go back after what I've done. And hearing my voice echo around this empty island makes me want to howl with sorrow. At night, Europa would look up into the firmament and think of her favourite brother Cadmus as she fixed her gaze onto the Phoenician star, the Pole Star. He taught her the rudiments of navigation. Nightly, she plotted her imagined path back across the ocean, back to her family. Many years later, she learned her brothers had been dispatched across the globe to find her, that Telephassa, her mother, had desperately taken to the sea in search of her lost daughter, and that she died heartbroken on a ship. Though Europa dreamt of swimming back towards Tyre by starlight, she knew she wouldn't survive alone out in the ocean. It was only because the bull was divine that their journey had been possible. And then, one day, Zeus put an end to all thoughts of escape with his gifts. He was holding her on his lap, telling her how pleased he was. Crete was his island. He'd been born in a cave near this very spot, raised by nymphs. It wasn't by chance he'd brought her here, and she was doing very well. And since he was so pleased, he'd prepared her some gifts. Four gifts. He held a large, closed fist in front of her, slowly opened the fingers to reveal a perfect golden necklace, crafted by Hephaestus, the jewels and joints as delicate as dew. Sometimes when she sat with him like this, she remembered his trickery. He still smelt like the bull. He still licked her neck sometimes. When he clasped the necklace into place, she shuddered. He seemed not to notice. Now it's time for your second gift, he announced. Rise and walk to that olive tree. Leaning against the bark of the trunk, she found a javelin. Try it out, said Zeus. She shook her head. She'd never hunted. He took it from her hands, hurled it himself. The javelin flew straight and true, pierced the neck of a wild rabbit running in the far distance. Her hand went up to her own neck. He laughed. It never misses, he said. And now the third gift. He paused and whistled. Something came running into view. A yellow dog, long-legged, its tail curled like an O, like an open mouth. The dog bounded up to Europa, licked her face. She recoiled. The animal was the same colour as the bull. He settled on the ground and looked up at her, still a pup, wide-eyed and innocent, not a killer. I suppose I like him, she said. Good, said Zeus. I knew you would. He's a hound that will always catch his prey. Useful gifts, aren't they? Now come and lie with me. First, tell me what my fourth gift is, said Europa. Ah, that's a special gift, he said. You can't miss it. Listen. It reminded her of the sound of shipyards back home. The sound of blacksmiths forging swords. The sound of the earth being broken open. What is it? she asked. You'll see, replied the king of the gods. Whatever it was, it was coming closer. Huge and metallic, it rose higher than the trees. She squinted her eyes against the sun and saw bronze shimmering. It was a giant metal monster, shaped like a man. A round face, a smiling mouth, empty eyes, a body of burnished metal. 
the dog near Europa whined. Behold your protector, said Zeus, indicating the bronze giant. He circles the island three times a day, making sure you're safe. She knew then that she would never leave, that her family would never reach her. She knew then that she would die on the island of Crete. She turned her face to the sky and wept. Later, she learned that the metal monster was called Talos. He was crafted by Hephaestus. Was he truly alive, she wondered. He seemed to see things and understand what he saw like a living being. He would always turn his head when she grew bold enough to call out his name. Later still, she learned that divine blood surged through his body through a single vein, running from his neck to his ankle. Anyone wishing to destroy him would need to drain him of his blood. Europa dreamed of slicing through that vein with a scimitar or sword, but she'd never been trained in the arts of war, and her javelin was hopeless. It would bounce off his bronze legs and fall to the ground. At times like this, she felt powerless and wished she belonged to another race of women, Amazons or Spartans. Someone did eventually destroy Talos, and that someone was a woman. But that really is another story. Over time, Zeus must have wearied of Europa. He visited her less often, seemed less enamoured of her. Early one morning, he came to see her, lifted her up, and carried her across the island. It was time for her to visit the rest of Crete, he said. She first saw the palace from a distance, a giant sprawl of buildings, dazzling in the light. She thought the island was deserted, yet here was a civilization more sophisticated than her father's. The palace was like an entire city, built on multiple levels, streaming with people, lush with gardens. King Asterion was sitting outside under some fruit trees. Here, I've brought you a gift, said Zeus, and he dropped Europa into the king's lap. I wonder if King Asterion fell in love with my beautiful grandmother, as he called her then. Or did he admire her later, as she stood straight as an arrow, staring at the painted labyrinth in the palace grounds, her yellow dog beside her? Perhaps the king pitied her. Or he simply married her because that was Zeus's command. Europa would never say. The crown they placed on her head sealed her fate. She became queen of the land. This was home now. The foreign woman in her distant dream had finally claimed her. Over the next years, she gave birth to three children, Minos, Radamanthos, and Sarpedon. She may have been married to a mortal king, but these royal sons were the children of Zeus. I don't understand, I would say to my grandmother. You were married to Asterion, but those were Zeus's children. Europa would gaze down into her folded hands and stay silent. And when I'd ask my mother, Pasiphae, she'd say it was an honour to bear such divine children and how wonderful it was for our Cretan bloodline. After the three boys were born, Zeus stopped visiting altogether, and another chapter of Europa's life was closed. The wind has picked up here. A dust storm is on the way, bringing red sand with it. Inside of me, all is stormy too. Nothing will settle. My skin and clothes are slowly turning ochre, I should get up, take shelter, drink water, wash off the dust. But for now, I close my eyes. I want to linger a little longer in the garden with Europa. She sits eternally among the vines and musky flowers, ready to tell and retell her story, her yellow dog stretched out at her feet. Perhaps the young Europa wasn't as docile as I thought. It isn't an easy choice to make peace with life, after all. Yet somehow she managed it. She looks up and sees me, reaches out a heavily braceleted arm towards me. The dog raises his head, 
barks once in recognition. Night is coming. The first stars pierce the dark. Europa's ancient arms encircle me. Didn't Zeus place the constellation of Taurus in the sky for you, I ask her, looking up. No, sweetheart, she says. The constellation of Taurus isn't a bull at all. It's a heifer. Tell me that story, I say, as the light fades. I don't want to leave you. We won't leave Ariadne for long. Her story is far from over. We'll return to her on the island of Naxos in our next episode to learn about another of her ancestors, Io. Dear listeners, we're so happy to be back for a third season. Over the next few episodes, we'll explore Ariadne's story in depth, plunging into her family's dark secrets. We'll follow her thread beyond the labyrinth into the distant past and into her extraordinary future. This episode of Tales of the Night Sky was written and narrated by me, B.B. Jacob. Sound and production by Jeff Chong. Sources for this retelling include Moschus's poem Europa, Roberto Colasso's The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, and Ariadne's letter to Theseus from Ovid's Heroides, which you can hear me read on Late Night Classics. The link is in the show notes.